Okay, so uh, hi, my name is Chris Down. Uh, I work at Facebook London as a production engineer. I'm going to be giving kind of a whistle stop tour of the new version of control groups added in Linux 4.5. Don't worry if you haven't the faintest idea what, uh, what a control group is yet, or you only vaguely know. Um, we'll go over like some basics in the next couple of slides. So like I said in this talk, I'm going to be going over the uh, next version of C, uh, C groups. I'll give a short introduction, kind of what they're for, where you may have seen them. Um, if you already know something called C group, you've almost all, uh, certainly been using version one of C groups. Version 1 has been out since 2008, and in many ways it's kind of helped to kickstart our love of containerization uh, and process management. Um, it's kind of the backbone of a lot of systems like System D and Docker and that kind of stuff. Um, so we've been using it all over the place since then. Um, so obviously it has a bunch of good functionality. Unfortunately it also has a, a ton of caveats and issues and kind of usability shenanigans, um, which make it really difficult to use sensibly. Um, Secret V2 is, is our attempt to fix these uh, and improve it, and it's under a lot of active development now. Secret V1 is mostly in maintenance mode. Um, so I want to go over kind of why we needed to introduce a new major version of Secrets, why we couldn't just do more improvements to version 1. I also want to go over some of the fundamental design decisions in, in Control Group V2. Um, and uh, another thing is that Control Group V2 is being made also to enable a bunch of future improvements. Um, so I want to go over what's ready for use in production uh, and what is still kind of in the pipeline. Um, the general idea is that the core is ready, but we still have a whole bunch of more goodness yet to come. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working at Facebook for about three and a half years now. Um, I work in this team called Web Foundation. Technically, Web Foundation, as you'd expect by the name, is responsible for the web servers at Facebook. Um, but Web servers are generally not a super complicated thing, um, so we also kind of act as probably the closest thing that Facebook has to a, to a SRE team. Um, so we delve into the whole stack at Facebook, we deal with uh, production issues, um, basically all kinds of issues across the stack. We, we own incident resolution in production um, at Facebook. Um, as you'd imagine then, if we own like this very large piece of uh, like Facebook in general, um, we have a whole bunch of different types of people to support us in that. Um, so we have system debuggers, that's mostly what I do. Most of my background is in system administration and, and system debugging. Um, we also have domain experts in our, in our cache architecture, um, RPC, uh, task scheduling. We also have experts in things like uh, Hack and HHVM, which is our JIT compiler for PHP. And we're not working on C groups. Most of my time is spent like dealing with these kind of systemic issues across Facebook and dealing with service issues as they come up. So this brings me on to why I give a shit about C groups. So we have many, uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of servers at Facebook. Um, and we run a bunch of services on those servers. Um, and I care a lot about limiting the failure domains um, that we have across Facebook. The reality at Facebook is that most outages are not a single service having problems. They tend to be um, failures across multiple services, sometimes cascading failures. Um, and we want to be able to restrict those. We don't want multiple services to be uh, able to affect each other like that. Um, there are a lot of things that you need to do to, get, to be able to get to the stage where you're comfortable saying cascading failures are somewhat mitigated. Uh, one thing you need to do is understand and isolate your dependencies and try and minimize the dependency chain of applications. But another huge thing that you need to do is to be able to stop other processes on the machine from affecting the thing that you actually want to do, from stopping you from doing that. So if you look at kind of a typical server, um, so you have the core workload on pretty much every machine. It's the main thing that you want to do on that machine. Um, for example, uh, on our web servers, that would be HHVM, which runs our PHP code. Um, or on our load balancer, it would be, uh, for example, like HAProxy or Proxygen, which is our uh, load balancer. Um, this is the thing that you do on that machine. This is the thing that if you were to describe to somebody else what that machine does, you would say it was this. Um, there are also a bunch of system processes. Most large companies and even small companies nowadays have this kind of tax, um, which is essentially processes which you have to run to work inside your infrastructure. Um, these typically help the core workload in some way. They might be a dependency for the core workload, or they might be run to keep the system working. Um, uh, but they tend to be less important than the main workload. Um, for example, uh, Chef is really vital for an up-to-date machine, um, but if there was some bug in your cookbooks or you can't, you can't uh, run successfully and it's constantly thrashing the machine, you don't want to stop web requests being run for that. You want to deal with that separately. Um, then you have these kind of rarer things, um, like ad hoc queries and debugging, 
These are things that you typically only know that you need reactively uh, when you're dealing with an incident. Um, so these can vary in importance. Some of them you want to run in the background. Some of them you actually actively want to interrupt the main workload for. Um, and we want to kind of give people the power to dynamically determine the importance of these things. So this is a kind of problem that is really a very good use case for C groups. So in the previous slide, we talked about multiple processes fitting into each of these groups. Um, a control group can consist of as many or as few processes as you like, and you can set limits and thresholds as tightly or as flexibly as you like for a service or application. Um, for example, you can have all processes which relate to a particular service in one C group, um, or do whatever you like. Uh, we don't impose a structure on you, that's the idea of C groups. The idea is the framework should be flexible to your requirements and not impose a direct structure on you. So a C group is a control group, they're one and the same. As you've probably guessed by now, they're a system for resource management on Linux where resource means something that processes share. CPU, memory, I.O., that kind of stuff. Management is a bit more complicated. You're probably already thinking of things like the Oom killer. That is one option you have. We also have some kind of more subtle things which you can do with C groups like uh, throttling. Uh, we also provide a bunch of accounting, so every single part of the C group hierarchy exposes metrics about what's going on, which makes it much easier to debug. Um, C groups are typically not a very complicated thing to manage because they are uh, directories at SysFS C group. Um, we don't have a system call interface for the very core parts of C groups. Um, we do have for some more esoteric parts. Um, but this means that creation, deletion, modification, that kind of stuff is all doable by uh, your typical application. All you need to do is like mkdir, rmdir, right? I mean, I hope whatever hipster language people are using nowadays still supports those things. Uh, and this, this makes it really, really trivial to interact with C groups no matter what. You, uh, w no matter what you're using. You can just go into your shell and cat some files or ls some directories and you get information about the C group hierarchy. Each resource interface is provided by what's called a controller. Um, this controller essentially provides files which you can manipulate and it interacts with the kernel. Um, so say the memory controller provides a file called memory.limitinbytes which allows you to set a memory limit. And when you set a value inside that file, just by printing a string to this particular kernel file, file, uh, you change the way the kernel will behave. You, you tell the kernel, hey, I want you to do this for this particular C group. So as mentioned previously, workload isolation is a super large use case for you, C groups. You might have one thing on your machine which you want to run and a bunch of background services which you want to deprioritize. Um, the same is true for things like asynchronous jobs. Um, at Facebook, we have a large asynchronous tier which runs things which can be processed in the background in a different queue. Um, and some jobs may have higher priority than others. Um, or be longer running than others, but what priority means here is typically very case specific. Um, it might be that we, uh, we give it more CPU, we allow it more access to the disk, uh, we allow it more access to memory, or anything. Like priority is generally uh, discernible in terms of resources. Another third use case is these kind of shared environments like uh, VPS providers which run containers where you don't want to allow one particular customer to override the needs of another customer and start to affect or dip into their, their allocation. So you might be thinking at this point, hey, my, what, what the fuck is this guy talking about? My, my favorite product already has this functionality. Why do I need to talk about C groups? Well, it might be true that your, your favorite product does have this functionality, but if it's been made in the last eight or nine years, it almost certainly uses C groups under the hood. C groups are the most mature interface that we have in the kernel for managing resource management and resource allocations. Um, and these are generally the way forward. I think it's generally pretty accepted by now that despite C groups being kind of the feature which kernel developers love to hate, they are kind of the way forward. Um, and even if your product doesn't use them, it almost certainly should be at this point. So let's take a look at how this works in version 1. It's very important to understand how version 1 works to be able to understand how version 1 doesn't work. Uh, so like I mentioned, if you've had some interaction with C groups in the past, it's almost certainly been with version 1. Version 2 has been in development for over five years now, uh, six years I think now, uh, and uh, it's only become stable though quite recently in kernel 4.5. Even on recent kernels, you'll discover uh, version 1 is typically used by default. And what I mean by that is the kernel boots supporting both, um, but typically your init system only mounts the version 1 hierarchy. Um, the kernel by default also only typically enables the controllers, like the memory controller or the CPU controller, for the version 1 hierarchy. Um, these controllers can only exist in either version 1 or version 2. You can run in this kind of mixed mode. Um, 
So in recent versions of systemd, we actually mount both the version 1 and version 2 hierarchy, um, but we don't actually use version 2 for resource control. We only use it for some systemd internal stuff. Um, and what we really need is this resource control, which is what we're going towards. The reason that we still mount the version 1 hierarchy and still use it mostly is for backwards compatibility. Most applications don't give a shit which, which secret hierarchy you use. They don't look at it. Um, but uh, applications like Docker, for example, or, or systemd as well, have to support secret v2 if they're going to actually try and use the hierarchy to do things. For most applications, it's completely transparent. Um, but for those higher level, uh, lower level applications, it tends to be quite important. So this talk is also kind of a sell on why you should care about Secret V2 and why you should work to support and understand it. Because understanding how version 1 works is really key to understanding uh, the improvements that have been made in version 2. So in version 1, uh, SysFS C group contr contains controller names or resources as directories at the top level. Resources like CPU, memory, PIDs, I.O., that kind of stuff. Inside these directories are hierarchies for each resource. You can see inside here we have the PID controller, um, which contains a bunch of different slices, just a, a system D terminology. But these are all essentially C groups. They are directories which are C groups. Um, and each directory inside here will contain files which are related to the business of controlling process IDs. So each resource here has its own resource distribution hierarchy. Um, resource A here could be memory. Resource B could be CPU. Um, and one thing to note is even if C group 3 here in resource B had the same name as C group 1 in resource A, say they're both called foo.slice, um, from the kernel's perspective, they have absolutely no relation to each other, even if they contain the same processes, which has some really interesting and somewhat negative implications, which I'll come back to later. Um, you might also notice the C groups are being nested inside each other in this example. Um, for example, C group 2 is a child of C group 1. Um, generally, what this means is that C group 2 inherits the properties of C group 1 and can set more restrictive limits inside its own C group. So one PID is in exactly one C group per resource in C group V1. So PID 2 here is explicitly assigned to resources A and C, but we didn't explicitly assign it in resource B, so it's in what's called the root C group. Um, the root C group is at the base directory for this resource controller. For memory, it would be sysfs C group memory. Um, the root C group is essentially limitless. It's not very useful. It's generally for things which we've not categorized at all. Um, you still get some kind of accounting, but that's basically it. You don't really get anything. These things are essentially unlimited. So here's a concrete look at how this looks at C group 1. Um, like I say, I really want to iterate this because otherwise the rest of this talk is going to make no fucking sense. Um, so the C group file system is typically mounted at sysfs C group. Um, inside you have these resources like memory, CPU, that kind of stuff. Um, you can have a single PID in C group foo in one resource, but C group bar in another. You don't have to have them in the same C group in different resources. And again, even though we have two C groups here, it seems, two named, uh, one named ad hoc and one named BG, there are actually four C groups. Um, from the kernel's perspective, even if they have the same name, they're completely unrelated, and this has a bunch of negative effects. So let's take a look at how this works in Cgroup v2, now that we've talked about Cgroup v1. So in Cgroup v2, you might notice now, at sysfs Cgroup, we no longer see the names of resources. We used to see memory, CPU, I.O., that kind of stuff. Now we just see background.slice, workload.slice. We just see the, the Cgroups themselves. So how does the Cgroup know which resource it should apply to? So the answer is it doesn't. Um, the way this works is almost entirely inverted. So now C groups are not created for a particular resource. Resources instead are enabled or are disabled in a particular part of the C group hierarchy. Um, this means that we have a single hierarchy to rule them all. We don't need to have disparate hierarchies for every single resource, um, which has a bunch of positive effects, which I'll go into in a moment. Um, this means that you explicitly opt into, say, having the CPU controller enabled in a particular subtree of the C group hierarchy. And once you've opted in for this, we give you files like how much CPU we should give this application compared to, to other applications. So in C group v2, we have a similar hierarchy here, but note the differences. Instead of having four C groups like this, we now have two like this. Uh, instead of also having a C group per resource, we now have uh, resources per C group, which allows us to opt in to resources that we care about on the fly. You don't have to build these things as you go along. As you can see here, we, in version 1, we have a C group hierarchy per resource. That is, C groups only exist in the unique context of a particular resource. They are not universal. Um, and remember, again, that these C groups, even though they have the same name, have no relation to each other. So 
the way that this works in SIGGroup v2 is you write to this file, this magical file called SIGGroup.subtreeControl, and you write, say, plus memory, plus CPU, whatever, which particular resource you want to enable. And when you do this, files related to that resource appear in that SIGGroup's children for use. So what are the fundamental differences we're talking about here? So obviously the big one is this unified hierarchy where resources apply to cgroups now instead of cgroups applying to resources. This is extremely important um, for some extremely common operations in Linux. Uh, a classic case is kind of uh, a page cache write back. These operations which transcend a single resource, because for example, a page cache write back is CPU, IO, and memory all at the same time. And it's previously really difficult to decide um, what operations are sensible to perform to reduce pressure. It's also really difficult to account for these things since we have different hierarchies for each resource. Um, we can't tie in version one, one C group's actions in one resource to another C group's actions in another resource because they're not required to contain the same processes. Um, so with this single hierarchy, we now have a single thing to rule them all, and we can make decisions with much better context across the system. We also now, in version 2, have granularity at the TGID, not the TID level. Um, the reason for that is because uh, without extensive cooperation, it generally doesn't make sense to have thread granularity for C group control. Um, the reason for that is Generally, you need a cgroup manager, a single thing in your system which does cgroup, uh, cgroup distribution across the system. Um, and you need to expose your in program intentions somehow. Um, you need to expose this thread does this, and you should put it in this cgroup, and this thread does that, and you should put it in this cgroup, and so forth. There's no real standardized way to do that in Linux. Um, you can, for example, set the com of your thread and, and somehow set something to regex match on the com of your thread. But this is all kind of like sideways because the, pro the real problem here is also that a lot of resources don't make any sense at the TID level. Like in version one, there was a non-trivial amount of people who were setting uh, different memory C groups from different threads of the same process. Which doesn't make any fucking sense in the vast majority of cases. Um, it is kind of vaguely deterministic, um, but it generally doesn't work and doesn't do what you would expect. Um, so we do actually, in version 2, have also some more restricted APIs um, for thread control where possible. Uh, Tejon, who is uh, one of the primary authors of Secret V2, uh, recently introduced this thing called rgroup, which is essentially a, a way to do thread control for some resources which make sense. But these things are local to the process. Um, so this is kind of limited to those use cases where it makes sense. Um, and has to be implemented per controller. You can't just uh, willy-nilly put them in a particular controller where it doesn't make any sense. We also have this major uh, focus on simplicity and clarity over ultimate flexibility. In many places in version 1, um, design followed the implementation um, because it wasn't clearly known like what the use cases were at the time. Some flexibility in version 1 made implementation really, really difficult. Um, for example, this, this per thread control, like people putting threads in, a, in memory, different memory C groups um, and do, trying to account for things that cross multiple resource domains. And the idea here is that we should provide a framework that guides towards a correct solution by default. You shouldn't have to muck around in the documentation forever to work out how your thing is even going to basically work. Another new feature in Cgroup 2 is this thing called the no internal process constraint. Um, so this means essentially that uh, C groups cannot create child C groups if they have processes and they also have controllers enabled. To put it another way, the C groups in red here either have to be empty or they have to have no controllers enabled at all. They have to have no memory, no IO, that kind of stuff. This is for a number of reasons. Um, one of the primary ones is that generally child processes don't make sense uh, to compete with their parent for resources. Um, and generally doing that can be kind of hard technically. Um, another reason is that we have to make some implicit decisions about what this means. Say I put a bunch of processes in C group I here, and then I also put a bunch of processes in C group J. Now we have to make a decision about how we're going to consider two different types of objects. One, a child C group, which is J, and two, a single process which is contained within the I C group. We can do all sorts of things. One of the things we did in version one was implicit C group creation. So if you put a, uh, some set of processes in I, there would be this implicitly created I prime C group, which would contain those processes and they would share kind of C group contention. But it doesn't make any sense to do this implicitly. And it's usually not what anyone thought would happen. Um, so this is why we've moved to, you have to kind of explicitly put things at the leaves. You might also notice that the root C group is not red. Um, the reason for that is the root C group is a special case. 
um, for general system consumption, for things which we have not categorized. How the root C-group is handled is entirely up to the controller. Um, the controller has to make a decision about how to prioritize the things which have not been categorized at all from the things which have been categorized. So obviously breaking the API is kind of a big deal. This is a very major kernel API. Um, so you need a good reason to do this. Um, so the reasoning here is like version one worked acceptably in some basic scenarios, but it gets exponentially complicated and not very usable in complex use. Um, as I mentioned before, in version one, uh, design often followed implementation. Uh, and the problem with that is reworking kernel APIs after the fact is really, really hard. Like, it generally, you cannot change kernel APIs after you've defined them clearly. Um, so we kind of needed the API break there. Even for stuff which was designed up front and had like explicit design goals, um, the use cases for cgroups in 2008, when it was invented, were not really that well fleshed out yet. Um, it was kind of hard to work out at the time how cgroups would eventually be used. Um, this led to a bunch of over flexibility in places that you don't want it. Um, and it also led to a whole bunch of complexity in places which should be simple, even the basic building bo blocks of cgroups. So to fix these fundamental issues in cgroups, we kind of had to create cgroup v2 because it fundamentally changes the way we think about resource control. So I'm hoping you're still with me because I've gone over a lot of what we've changed, but not a lot of why we've changed it. Um, so it, it really is important to understand what we've changed because otherwise the next set section is not going to make any sense at all. Um, so I want to go not only into what we've done, but why we've done it. What does Secret V2 bring us that we didn't have in version 1? So uh, pop quiz, it's Q&A time. When you write to a file in Linux, what happens? Don't be scared. Kyle, would you like to give an answer? He would not like to give an answer. Over there. user space buffers in the program, and then things can get buffered at, uh, like, in the kernel level, and then usually after the buffers kind of trickle down, there's the block disk writes. Uh-huh. Absolutely correct. So th that's, that's totally, did everyone get that? Um, so basically the basic principle is there are a lot of layers of caching and buffering, and yeah. The main one we're looking at here is pa the page cache. So when you write to a file in Linux, you issue a writes call or whatever, um, and your writes as call may return almost immediately. Um, and that's because you've, what you've actually done is not write a file to the disk, you've written a dirty page or some dirty pages into the page cache, uh, into memory. Um, and at this point, your writes as call is returned with success. So hooray, your process can continue. But of course, in the real world, it's not actually done. Your, your application can continue pretending it's done, but it's not actually done. Um, so eventually, this dirty page needs to make its way back to the disk. It needs to make its way back to the storage device, which it's supposed to go to. But when does it get written to disk? How does it get written to disk? Who writes it to disk? Um, well, the dirty pages here were made on behalf of your application. Um, but the flush to disk could happen an indefinite amount of time after, depending on your particular uh, syscuddles. Um, but the main point is these two actions are kind of disconnected. Like The eventual write to disk is completely disconnected from the write which you first made. So in secret v1, these page cache writebacks went to the root C group. They were essentially completely limitless. Um, for some workloads, this can be a huge amount of I.O. and memory. Like, a lot of I.O. on some workloads can just be doing page cache writebacks, and we couldn't account for them. We couldn't even tie them back to your application. And not accounting for these means not only a bunch of I.O. is not available for accounting, but a bunch of memory is also not available for accounting. We can't account for these dirty pages. We can't tie them back to your application. So in cgroup v2, we actually track these actively um, and map the request back to the original cgroup. Um, so we're able to account these page cache writebacks back to your application and say, this application was responsible for the pages which are now being written to disk and charge it, say, to your I.O. controller. Um, so now we can also understand the relation of I.O. and memory for a writeback, which we previously couldn't do since we had different hierarchies for every single resource. Um, this also applies to some other kinds of things, like imagine you're receiving a lot of packets from the network. That takes a non-trivial amount of kernel CPU in some circumstances. A lot of it can be offloaded, but in general, yes, it does take some amount of CPU. And it's also difficult to account for that um, in C group v1, because we simply cannot say this action which occurred in the past 
is now related to your process. We couldn't tie those things together because we had no way of tagging those packets, the CPU that was involved, as being related to your process eventually. So in Secret V2, we can now do these things and perform some kind of reasonable methods of reclaim or uh, whatever you want to do to your process based on the limits. More things can be accounted towards your process limits. V2 is also generally better integrated with subsystems. Um, so in version one, most of the actions we could take uh, for example, in the memory controller, were pretty violent. Um, they were, they were pretty, pretty crude, generally. Um, for example, pretty much the only sensible action you could take against a process if it violated some memory limit you set was to umkill it, um, which is generally not what applications like. Generally, applications don't respond very well to being kill nined. Uh, that's not usually like the way applications like to be treated. Um, there is another way, which is we also had this thing called freezer. So what Freezer would do is, instead of umkilling a process, we would say, OK, we're going to freeze it at this point in time. Um, so we would essentially leave it there, and some other system with some other context would come and make a decision whether we should unfreeze the process by raising the limits, or whether we should do things like uh, kill the process or get a stack trace from the process and kill it. It was totally up to you. The problem was Freezer in V1 literally more or less uh, stopped you at whatever stack you were in. Like, we, we could be in some very deep kernel stack and you would just be told stop. And the problem is, a lot of these things are not resumable. You can't just stop and expect it to go well after you start again. Um, we also had a whole bunch of problems with, like, one of the key things people wanted to do with, with Freezer is go and grab a stack trace and then kill it. But in a lot of cases, these processes would just go into D state and would never be able to come out of it again. So when you try and attach GDB to that process, it would also go into D state, which is not at all what you wanted at all. Um, so it was kind of all sorts of fuckery and shenanigans uh, going on with this, with this freezer in V1. Um, and yeah, it was just not workable, really. So really, the only option you had was to kill shit outright, which was not ideal. Um, so we did have this. There's a tiny note about it at the bottom. We did actually have a soft limit in version one. However, it doesn't work. It's like it's very difficult to reason about how it will work at any point. It has a bunch of heuristics around local C group local memory pressure, global memory pressure, uh, the phase of the sun, uh, that kind of shit. It's like very very hard to reason about. It basically is impossible to reason about. So we can just pretend for the time being it doesn't really exist. Um, so in C group two. We, we have much clearer thresholds uh, on these hard limitable resources. For example, we have memory.low, uh, memory.high, memory.max, where low and high are best effort. Uh, and uh, if, if we had min and max, then they would be kind of absolute thresholds. Um, for example, on memory.high, we do direct reclaim. Um, so direct reclaim is uh, essentially where we try and scan the, the page table and find some pages to, to reclaim. We do this when you allocate some more memory. So say you malloc or icebreak or whatever. Um, and if you are above the memory.high threshold already, uh, we will try and scan and reclaim pages from, this, from the working set. Um, this works whether or not your application actually successfully reclaims pages. Because if you successfully reclaim pages, then good. We're back under the limit again, and it doesn't matter. It's like nothing ever happened. If you don't reclaim pages, we have to scan a whole bunch of the page table before we allow your application to continue. So it acts as this kind of primitive slowdown for your application, which is kind of agnostic to your application. This works well in some scenarios and doesn't work very well in some other scenarios, but it allows you to have kind of a more granular control over how you want to treat applications which behave not as you expect. Um, one way that you can use this is to deal with temporary spikes in resource usage uh, by slowing down an application instead of just killing it outright. For example, if your application at a certain point of execution always spikes to a certain point of resource usage, instead of just killing it every time it gets there, you can slow it down for that short period and then continue running. Uh, we also have a new notification API. So notifications are essentially a way to tell some something when a C group has changed state. Um, so it could be that we have no more processes in the C group, which means all of the processes there have ended, um, or something oomed, uh, or generally some action occurred in your C group. System D uses this under the hood to track processes and track process state. Um, it uses it basically to manage which services are in a particular state and keep track of the system. 
So in version 1, we actually do support this, um, but it can get really expensive. So in version 1, to know when you have no more, uh, no more processes to run, uh, you have to specify what's called a release agent ahead of time. This release agent is literally a binary. It's just like you give a, you give a path to, uh, to cgroups, and it will exec that path every single time that uh, this cgroup is, has no more processes in. The problem is, there are some asynchronous workloads which will create thousands and thousands of cgroups a second, legitimately. And that means you have to do thousands and thousands of clones a second as well, which is a non-trivial amount of resource usage just on cloning shit. Um, so uh, we also have uh, other events which you can look at in cgroup v1, like say if something oomed in the cgroup. Um, these are done through the poll interface, through the, through the event FD F interface. Um, and this generally works. Um, but since these are files, it also makes sense to have iNotify to support. Um, so now we also support iNotify events, which makes sense since we're treating the secret hierarchy as a bunch of files and directories. Um, and generally, this is kind of a more intuitive API. We do still have the old ways of doing, uh, doing this, but generally iNotify is a, a kind of a more sensible way of doing this overall. And this makes uh, getting these notifications way less expensive than they were in V1. So uh, utility controllers kind of also make sense now. Um, utility controllers are controllers that don't manage a resource directly, but for whatever reason want to have their own cgroup hierarchy. Um, generally, they allow a user space utility to take some kind of actions based on the hierarchy. For example, in version 1, the, the perf tool has a cgroup hierarchy called perf event. Um, and perf is this tool which does performance tracing in, in Linux, um, and the perf event controller here has its own hierarchy to monitor and collect events for processes in its, its cgroup hierarchy. Uh, the same goes for Freezer, which also had its own cgroup hierarchy, um, and that, that encounters some problems, because typically what you actually want to do is take the cgroup hierarchy from some other particular resource and mimic it in the perf events hierarchy, or mimic it in the, in the freezer hierarchy. So you would have to do all sorts of crazy things like copy over all the different processes, or it, it was like bound to a bunch of race conditions and generally didn't work very well. So in version two, this is not a thing anymore because we have one hierarchy. So perf and freezer and everything all share the same hierarchy. You don't have to do any copying anymore. Whereas in version one, this was kind of prone to failure and esoteric bug reports on mailing lists. In version 1, we also have a bunch of inconsistency between controllers. Um, this kind of manifests in two typical forms. One is inconsistent APIs between controllers which do almost exactly the same thing. Uh, for example, for CPU, we have this shares API. And, and for block IO, we have this wait API. And they're completely unrelated to each other, even though they basically do exactly the same thing. Um, so in version 2, we've made a, uh, an explicit effort to have APIs that have similar possibilities of implementation to be as similar as possible. Um, this has both been an intentional goal, and generally having a unified hierarchy makes this an, uh, like an obvious path to take. The second uh, inconsistency between controllers is inconsistent semantics between different kinds of resources. So most C groups, uh, especially the core C groups, uh, like I mentioned, inherit their parents' limits. If you have a child of a C group, it inherits its parents' limits, and you can set more restrictive limits in the child. Um, but some, some, some resources treated the C group hierarchy as almost like a, a dream or like a, a something which it didn't even have to think about. The net controllers were kind of a classic example, which didn't really care about the C group hierarchy. They just treated it as if it was one flat thing. Um, so people were really confused when they tried to use these controllers. Um, so the unified hierarchy uh, kind of helps us towards avoiding these inconsistencies in controllers, um, and we apply the same rules to controllers equally. They generally cannot deviate from the set of expectations that we have. Another very severe problem is that some things in V1 were just simply impossible. Um, for example, when memory limits were first made, we had this file called memory.limit in bytes, and we went, whoopee, we have a memory limit in bytes. Um, but the problem is, Eventually, it was, it was known that this covers a very limited set of memory types. Um, and we couldn't really add other types of memory to be accounted for in memory.limit in bytes, because, again, it's a kernel API. It's a stable kernel API, and you can't really change it. Um, so you eventually ended up with a bunch of different memory types, each in their own file. So you didn't just have memory.limit in bytes. Now you have memory.kmem.limit in bytes, memory.kmem.tcp.limit in bytes, one for swap. One for socket buffers. You had a different limit for every single type of memory. This poses an incredibly bad problem. 
so you have two choices now. Either you only set memory.limit in bytes and you accept the fact that your application is not actually bound by that limit in bytes because it only accounts for a very small number of memory types. Or you set limits on every single type of memory type and you cry when you allocate one TCP buffer too, memory, too many because you're going to get oom-killed because you allocated one TCP buffer too many. I don't know about you, but when I'm writing an application, I don't usually think to myself, ah, yes, I have a very specific number of TCP buffers in mind for this application. Generally, this is not how people think. Um, so in, in version 2, this unintuitive behavior has resulted kind of in more unified limits. We just have this thing called memory.high, memory.max. We've tried to make these things encompass all the types of memory that we possibly can. Um, and this is kind of a trade-off between this flexibility and overall usability. From practical use and from talking to people, we know that merging these into a global memory limit generally makes the most sense for most workloads. Um, this means you don't get those nasty surprises like, oops, I allocated one too many socket buffers, and I got oom killed. Um, and if you really need separate limits, uh, the proper way to do that is to have a, a new controller. You, you create a new controller which does this particular type of limiting. And that's what we did, for example, with the PID controller, because it was originally thought you could limit the number of PIDs uh, by limiting the amount of kernel memory in certain, in certain things. But it turns out that's really, really hard. Um, so we have now a PID controller which does that separately. So if you go to facebook.com now, uh, you will touch a web server which has secret v2. Um, we're running a secret v2 pool in the tens of thousands of machines, um, easily the largest secret v2 pool in the world. Um, we're investing heavily in secret v2 for a bunch of reasons. Um, like I said, my main concern is limiting the failure domain of applications um, and getting kind of this better handle on how system services are working across Facebook. Um, also, being able to manage the resource allocations in your data center more efficiently is a big win, especially if you have a huge number of servers. We run uh, Secret B2 managed with systemd. Uh, my, my friend David Okavalka over there uh, gave a talk yesterday um, about that, which I'm sure if you didn't attend, then um, very, very sad, but uh, you'll be able to find the video later. Um, and we're a whole, huge contributor to the core of Secret B2 um, and C group, uh, systemd's C group support. Um, and we're continuing to kind of drive innovation here. We have a lot of open issues against systemd and a lot of development which is being done. So Secret V2 has been stable for a little while now. That doesn't mean there isn't still work to be done here. The core APIs are stable, but there's still a bunch of functionality we're working on. When thinking about C groups, most people think of three things, CPU, IO, and memory. Um, the CPU controller is very important, but unfortunately it's not merged until 4.15. Um, the reason for that is the CPU controller folks had a number of reservations about some things which we were doing. Um, Tijan especially has been working very, very hard to mitigate their concerns, which is one of the things which led to this R group uh, API being made. Um, so now we have it merged in 4.15, which is not even stable. So eventually we will get there. Um, as kind of a bonus, I do want to go over one thing we're using C group v2 for, um, and one thing we want to provide as part of C group v2. So one thing we've never really had in Linux is uh, a measure of memory pressure. Um, we have a bunch of related metrics like uh, memory usage and buffer usage, and we can also look at the number of page scans, but with these metrics alone, it's hard to tell the difference between extremely efficient use of a system and overuse of a system. It's kind of hard to tell the difference. Um, so one proposed measure here is to track page refaulting. The way it would essentially work is um, when, you've, when you uh, continually reclaim a page and fault it back in again, um, we will account for this, we will measure this, we put it in a particular, in a particular uh, counter, and then we look for, did this page get refaulted X times in, say, 100 milliseconds or a second? And that's a good measure for things like, um, are we exceeding our limits? Are we constantly reclaiming something because we consider it's not in use, and then having to fault it in again a second later? Um, so this is one place that we're exploring as a potential measure for memory pressure. Um, so as for future, as for future work, like I said, we currently have I/O and memory accounting for for page cache writebacks, but we don't have CPU accounting. If you spend CPU there, we currently can't account for that, and that's something we're working on. Um, V2 also has a bunch of different uh, improvements in what types of I/O we can account for. One thing we still can't account for is uh, some kinds of file system metadata. So if you are cough Apple and you store all of your files in uh, extended metadata, it's probably not going to end very well for you. Um, 
I also just talked about uh, this refault, uh, this refault matrix uh, for detecting memory pressure. And another thing we're working on is uh, this this freezer for V2, um, which will use semantics which are much more similar to SIG stop instead of just freezing you where you stand and possibly never coming out again. So I've talked a lot to try and sell you on SIG V2. Hopefully you're interested in trying it out yourself. Um, with systemd, these are the flags that you need. You essentially need to disable the, uh, the secret v1 controllers and also tell systemd to mount the new hierarchy. Um, you need a kernel above 4.5 to do this. Before that, we do have unstable support, but it basically, yeah, I wouldn't recommend using it before 4.5. Um, so typically having your init system do this is a good idea, but if you do want to play around, you can also mount it directly by using uh, the file system type secret 2. So if you're interested in hearing more about uh, control groups, come talk to me. I'm happy to go over anything that I've been talking about. I think I have no time for questions, but, uh, but if you want to come talk about it, come talk to me. And if you've used version 1 in the past, which you almost certainly have, and you've encountered the prob kind of problems that I've been going over in this talk, please do come talk to me, and let's see how Secret V2 can work for you. Thank you. <laughs>